Again, my name is Mommy, and I have a pleasure of serving as district as superintendent. And um, we're here this evening because I think we did something that was quite remarkable. And that remarkable event was that we, in the first year uh, of my senior, uh, we had the ability and the uh, wherewithal of creating a strategic plan. I think it's a fairly comprehensive strategic plan. I think it's very inclusive. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the process, but more uh, importantly, I want to make sure that we take a lot of your questions. Um, when I arrived in the district, there was a strategic plan that was uh, scheduled to, to phase out at the 2021 school year. Um, and one of the, the components of the board asked me to consider was to create a strategic plan that was more uh, metric driven, uh, results oriented than the previous strategic plan. They realized that the strategic plan prior was more aspirational uh, in, in uh, form. Typically, school districts do create aspirational strategic plans. I think uh, I would encourage all of you, if you haven't had a chance to look at the past, the previous strategic plan, to take a look at that strategic plan and do a comparison of the current strategic plan that we have in place now and what we were operating under previously. Uh, I, and I think that the statement, I'm not making a statement of it's more comprehensive and more inclusive uh, just to fill work. I would encourage you to do your own comparison uh, and take a look at the strategic plan from 2017 to 2021 and this one. Um, what you can see, and I think you can't see it totally because of technology, so I'll try to move this. <clears throat> what you'll see is a timeline. And, can I? Okay. All right. What you'll see is that this process started a year ago. And it started a year ago, and I see some of the faces in the crowd, and some of you came and attended the, the listening tour. Um, and it was part of that listening tour where we started collecting data and started collecting the aspirations of the community in terms of what you wanted to see in your school. Um, from there, we had a community survey that went out. That community survey was for our school district community, and that took place in January and February. From there, we convened a strategic planning steering committee. It was a fairly large steering committee, and that committee was very committed to the process of making sure that this plan was different than past and previous strategic plans. They worked from April through June. Um, from June to July, we hired a number of new administrative, uh, administrators in the district. Those administrators from July 1st, technically prior to them even joining the district, had to get their arms wrapped around what does the strategic plan say and how are we going to execute and implement uh, these, these uh, metrics. And then finally, last month, the Board of Education approved the strategic plan. So that's the timeline. When some people say, well, boy, where did this come from? You have to keep in mind, we've been at this uh, this process for a long time. Um, when I look at the different focus groups and listening sessions that I've been part of, we had over 20 listening sessions uh, over the course of the past year. And those listening sessions range from the strategic plan, obviously, to other components of this plan ranging from how we were going to use answer funds to how we were going to select uh, our new administrators. One of the components that people shared with me that they wanted to see in the district was they wanted to have more input and have more of a say. And again, I would just argue um, in, in a very respectful but passionate way, compare how the engagement opportunities were provided last year to previous years, and, and I would I would uh, venture to share with you that I think there were ample opportunities for people to weigh in and give perspective.
Something else we'll do, do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> Maybe. Ah, hmm. oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's technology for you, right? But, yeah. So, what what is the structure of our strategic plan? The strategic plan, and you consider it like a house. Um, the first part of the strategic plan has the mission, the vision, the core values of the school district. That's really important. And we really stress that our steering committee and our board take a lot of time to look at what does this mean? What does it say? The mission, vision, and core values, they should represent who we are. Um, and who we inspire to be. Then there were goals that uh, emerged. And those goals emerged from the listening sessions and the surveys. And there were six goals that really emerged. The first was academic performance. The feedback that we received was that people in the community, both parents who are current uh, parents in, in the district, but also community members who may have had children go through the district in the past, for taxpayers, they're concerned about the academic performance of the district. They want us to be more competitive with our, our neighboring schools. For example, in February of this calendar year, we had a, an audit on our curriculum instruction and assessment um, program in the district. And we realized that when we looked at state assessments that compared to a neighboring school district, we were nearly 18 points behind a district that most neighbors, most residents would say our district should be comparable uh, to them. So there's a lot of work to do with our academic performance. The second was diversity and inclusion. And that was a theme that emerged as a very important component to our strategic plan and I think we want to be able to. The third was social, emotional, and mental health. Feedback that we've received from the community is that those are very important components to what we want to be and offer uh, to all of our students in the district. High quality staff. And I think it's really important that our, our, our steering committee and our, our, our feedback from the data indicated that people qualified and classified as high quality staff. So in other words, in other words, our community is saying we want the very best people in front of our set, our children. And there is also a message of, and we want you to provide professional development to our, our staff. We want to make sure that they're very, they're very best. And if they are the very best, we want to compensate those people uh, at the very uh, highest that we can. The fifth goal was community and culture. Making sure that we are creating a culture in our schools that embrace um, uh, inclusive, inclusivity and also we bring in the community. And then finally, operating. There was a, a strong theme from our steering committee that you have to have strong operations. You have to know where you're born. You have to make sure that you're taking care of your facilities, that you have a long range budget plan that you're looking at your enrollment. Um, some of the, I like to call it the basics of running a school district. We want us to attend to that work and not do it every other year, but to make sure that we're attending to it there. So those are goals. Then underneath each goal, there are strategic objectives. And that's where the work comes into play. And our steering committee, they were the ones, so community members, your neighbors, teachers, they created the strategic objectives. In other words, this is the work under each of the goals. This is what we have to accomplish. The orange portions are areas of the work that our administrators and our staff will be responsible for. The term or the, the acronym KPI stands for Key Performance Indicator. And if there's a key performance indicator that you can look to as a community and say, are we making 
our progress in this area or are we not? Again, that's the difference between the prior strategic plan and this current strategic plan. There are metrics that we will have to report out, not only to the board, but to the community. And then obviously there are action plans that our staff will execute. So what's our mission statement? Our mission statement is as a connected, inclusive community of learners, we serve as active advocates to provide equitable access to excellent, and that word excellent is underlined, academic and social emotional learning opportunities that empower every student to thrive as passionate, productive, and creative. Now, the steering committee, they, no pun intended, they steered us into this direction with the mission statement. I think the powerful mission statement and it's very visual. You can see what this statement is trying to convey. Our vision statement, that I'm missing one component of the board added something. It is to eradicate inequity, eliminate disproportionality, and see proficiency for all. And then here with a fourth added, which is to uh, ensure excellence, I believe it is. Give me one second, I can show you. And the fourth is to uh, ensure an exceptional student experience. Ensure an exceptional student experience. So those four statements become our vision statement. I won't read all of these to you, but there's a total of, I believe, eight different core values that the board identified and said, this is what we believe represents our core values. And then we get into, and I, again, I don't want to go through each of these goals, but there are strategic objectives under each of the six goals. Now the process, again, was one in which the board met we, we made an initial presentation of the strategic plan to the board on August 8th. They met in between the August 8th and August 22nd board meeting, and they made changes uh, to the strategic plan, significant changes. They met for over three hours, made changes. We came back to the August 22nd meeting, and they approved. So this is our strategic plan. I'm really, again, I'm proud of the fact that we have a plan that is as comprehensive um, that it is. Um, I think there were a lot of feedback that came even at the end of the plan um, from community members. And there were a lot of things that were added to the plan after we made the initial presentation on August. So. Let me pause here, because I don't want to talk actually, it's been about 16, 17 minutes or so of the presentation. Let me pause and see if you have any questions on the process. The process, how how we landed here, how, how we arrived at the point that we have now. Yes. They should give out to parents and community for all the steering meetings and things of that nature. Um, I have seen little bits here and there. So, what was that process for how you could get the community? So, starting back to the listening session, we sent out email words and within the Friday updates to, the, to parents that there were listening sessions. And then the survey that was released in January and February was again released to all parents through the Friday update and the email blast. And then there was a separate email blast that was sent out to all parents, uh, but also community members where we had the email addresses uh, asking them if they were interested in being on the steering committee. Um, I feel really confident that we did a comprehensive job in, in 
inviting people. We had over 60 people indicated they wanted to be part of the steering committee. So in fact, we had to turn some people away um, because it was just too large. So really feel good about the outreach um, process. Thank you. You're all, yes. When was the operations portion added? It was added. We didn't have an a operations company. We did not. We actually added that after the five were completed. And our CFO shared with me, I don't think we can do this to keep the plan unless I have an operations component to this. There was also, um, the steering committee also had a meeting with the CFO where we talked about a lot of the components in operations. How are you accounting for enrollment? How are you accounting for a facility that are you keeping uh, a good facility plan? Uh, how do you know that you have enough building or have too many buildings? And so that's when the operations go emerged. And so who came up with the work of the operations? The CFO. Okay, great. That's that's important. Along along with the board weighed in on that one significantly. So they added I'll I'll go to them because I think it's actually a really interesting in the multitude objectives of all of them. So you will see there's seven there and they're very, very specific. They talked about having a five-year fiscal forecast or ensuring that our, our operational or fund balance at 35 percent. These are Again, I would encourage you, take a look at the previous strategic plan, look at this one. It is, there isn't any ambiguity in this plan. Um, but our board then added the last two years, where quarterly the board shall review resource management metrics. How much facility rental revenue are we coming up with? Um, what's the purpose and reasons for facility rentals? Um, are we utilizing our schools appropriately? Are they a hub of our communities? Um, how how much type of revenue are we generating from our rec department? Uh, annually, the district will give uh, preference to vendors to to participate in partnerships focused on advancing the experience of students. These, these are all things that have come up through conversations and, and comments from the community and from, from board members. And then looking at the district presented to minority vendors and efforts to strategically communicate opportunities for contractual relationships um, with a more broad and diverse group of vendors. So that's objective A, 6.8. 6.9 talks about the board digging into their policy and, and making sure that they're, they're a policy driven board um, in collaboration with the superintendent, um, look for ways to. to to be innovative and discuss innovations that can go to scale. That's, that's things like our student programming or our Montessori school. How can we take Montessori, for example, to scale? So looking at innovations. And then uh, finally, making sure that we are uh, truly grounded in research when it comes to um, the work that we do. Yeah. 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 First question, historically, what percentage has the district been at? And then second question, Great questions. Dr. So, Means, uh, if you wouldn't mind repeating the question, uh, the attendees online can't hear them when they're being asked. So the question was, in June, I spoke with a community member who asked about our budget and, and how are we strategically budgeting for on the future of the district. And the question then went into where did we land and how did we land on 35% being the fund balance threshold uh, for our school district and what have we had in fund balance in the past? So I'll start with the last question in terms of where we've been with fund balance in the past. I think it's fluctuated. It is going up and down depending on how we utilize um, uh, deficit spending in the past. So deficit spending means that you can't have a budget, but not have enough in your operating budget so you go on to fund back. And so your fund balance will either go up or down depending on how much deficit spending you do. 
I'm proud to say that we had a balanced budget that was approved in October. And so by, by virtue of having a balanced budget in October, we didn't have to use our extra dollars the way that most other school districts in the metro area have used it. Um, the second is why 35%? We are a self-funded health insurance district. What that means is that we take on um, responsibility with our insurance being a self-funded health insurance plan. And so the experience of our health insurance can either hurt our overall fund balance or help us. If we're really healthy and doing well, then we'll save on our health insurance costs and then we can put more money back into fund balance. If we have a bad experience, if there are a few of our employees who have a difficult health uh, run, that may increase our health costs and then overall that means we may have to do some balance. So that 35 percent think about it this way we have an overall operating budget of about 85 million dollars and so 35 percent of that 85 million dollars always kept in a fund balance or we like to use the terminology with fund balance it's for a rainy day um it's for a rainy day either if we have that experience with insurance or in some cases that we have to continue to maintain a certain spending level but we're not getting the type of funding that we we, we need to sustain from the state so that's where the 35 percent comes from but that's your that's your original question this is a pretty comprehensive goal um one of the i wouldn't call it a criticism but i think one of the things that the steering committee um pushed us on and we had some steering committee members who had experience in leadership in the district in the past those steering committee members said this is this all sounds great this is all this is all sunshine and rainbows this, this sounds awesome how are you going to pay for it it all sounds wonderful. How are you doing your due diligence to make sure that we have a strong fiscal foundation? Um, and I think that's, again, where goal number six is. It's an essence to support the first five goals. You, you can't talk aspiration and then not have the funding to do it. What things externally dictate the amount of money that the state uh, school district brings in? Mentioned state funding, anything else that would cause that fluctuation to get into thirty five percent? No, um, other than our self self funded insurance, you have to keep in mind that a school board is an agent of the state government, so they are. I think sometimes we forget about that. They are the school board is. When you look at the state constitution, the state constitution states that the legislature is allowing the local community members to serve as the representatives of an, on a school board, but they are agents of the state government. And so the state government controls how much money school districts receive or don't receive. So um, that, that is that's the core of our funding. There's another component of our funding that we have to keep in mind that is it's not a large percentage, but it's a sizable percentage. And that is the federal government provides a certain level of money for the funding of uh, how we educate students with special needs. And they have never met the threshold that they promised to give to school districts for funding the needs of special needs students. So, so when you consider the fact that the state controls what school does every individual school district receive and then the federal government controls how much you will receive for educating students with special needs, which means that their their per pupil cost will be very individualized. One student may have special needs and the cost may look one way and it may be a different cost for another student. When you consider that both the state and the federal government is never funded at a full 100 percent of our needs it creates what we call a budget shortfall. So in essence, what school districts don't have the ability to do is to say, well, you know, however much we need to to support kids, they they are they they're restricted by with the state and federal government. 
which, I'm sorry, which makes this goal really important because the way that the legislators will say that their response would be, you know what? We can't give you all the money in the world. There's not a bottomless pit here of money. So what you have to do is manage what you do have really well. And the school districts that manage the money really well, they're the ones who differentiate themselves and really become, uh, I think, special places for children. This is your time. Uh, I'm assuming many of you had a chance to look at the strategic plan. I do have some, some facilitation questions I want to ask you, but I, I don't want to presume anything. So if you have questions, I, I want to make some more of a dialogue, it's not a monologue. Yeah. So I wasn't sure if you were going to go into the action steps for each of these or not. So I'll wait if you're playing. I'm not. Okay. So I was interested in the student profile. Um, can you explain a little bit more about how exactly that's going to be created? How who's going to do that? Are there going to be interviews with each and every student? How does that actually go down? That is a great question. So it's number 1.6, and there will be on the screen. That emerged from the board conversation. And the way that, that conversation unfolded was I, I believe that you're able to best meet student needs, regardless if they're gifted and talented or special needs, if you know who they are. And I use the uh, uh, analogy of a baseball card. When you have a baseball card, I don't know about you, but I'm of the vintage and age that I collect the baseball cards. When you collect baseball cards, you, you get to know not only the, the general information of the player, but you need to know a little bit about who they are as a person, what makes them tick, and how they're operating and how they're performing. There are platforms, there are uh, tools that allow us to know what, who, who is the mind, um, what makes him tick, what are his interests, what are, what are the skills that he or she brings. For those of you who are uh, veteran educators, 20, 30 years ago, we would say, go to the cumulative folder. And there was this folder, and as the student grew and went matriculated through our system, the folder would get larger and larger. And if you really had a good teacher, they would look and read every cumulative folder of every student they had. Unfortunately, because it was paper, typically teachers would only read the cumulative folder of the students who either were problems and they wanted to know what's the history of the student or someone who was really special or if they had an ID. This system will allow us to create a, a very intuitive, easy profile system that every teacher can go to and say, who are my students? Who are they? What makes them tick? What are their special interests? What are their skills? Uh, how are they performing? We want to use this tool, not in a way to prejudge the students before they come into your classroom, but so you know who they are, so you can better meet their needs. I don't know about you, but when you go to a service industry and you meet someone who's going to provide you a service for the first time, you feel better about your service when they know your name, when they know what to expect from you, and that's the purpose and the logic behind this stuff. How will, how will it be populated though? How will um, will a student be asked a series of questions? Yes. Are parents going to be our parents oh, involved? Oh, there will be parents. There will be surveys. And so in past districts that I've worked in, but nationally where this works, you ask parents the question of questions about the student, and it's going to change over time. Um, you have the student, what their interests are, and then that information populated in the system. And now you have a better who they are. There are multiple uh, systems that we all have to perform. We might have to perform. No, no. There's a lot of good ones out there. Would you doing to encourage teachers to leverage all that information to 
something live information is the teacher to actually utilize it. There's no difference in the file by trying to analyze the code. I'm sorry, Jay. Yes. I'm sorry. So there was one question that was, are you going to use a platform called Navion or something else? Um, Navion is kind of the, the industry leader in this space, but there are other tools and platforms that you could you could look at. Um, so that was one question, and the response was, we're not sure yet. Um, then there was another question, a really good question of, so what? So you have this platform, how are you going to make sure the teachers are able to actually use it? Um, and the response is, I, I can see, I said it last day at our meeting, I'll say it again. We are, we have a jewel in our early release Wednesdays. Um, most school districts would, they would give their, they would give a lot to have our early release Wednesdays. And so we will, we're going to get out of the way and let teachers figure out who are your students um, during those Wednesdays and utilize that platform throughout the school year to just recalibrate and talk about who, who are they, who are these students, how, how are we meeting their needs. The platform isn't about, again, prejudging the student. It's about, are you, are you sure you're meeting the needs of your students? I don't know about you, but how many of you been to the doctor recently? Anyone? If you go to the doctor recently, the hospitals have already gone to this type of model where they're they're asking you survey questions and they, they want to prepare to know you a little bit better before you walk into the office. And so this is this is not I don't think this is new technology. The, the, the question was thrown out there, what about Naviance? Naviance is a tool that has been used mainly with counsel and counselors. We want to make sure that we use a tool that's going to truly identify um, information for teachers and everyone so they can all look at the profile. I would love to have this profile in place so when a student says, I want to be an astronaut, and we see that they're not taking any science and science course and they're not in film, then, then what are we doing wrong? And I think that's one of the main arguments that families have said, why well, if you want to be an astronaut, but we're not giving them access or giving her access to certain things. All of our kids have green and natural then profile will capture it so that we can better meet their needs. The parents have access to profile. Yes. Yes. So it will be the baseball card. And so every year we'll, we'll send home, here's what your student profile looks like. Now you may, so, so you may get the profile and say, that's not my, that's not the kid I live with. <laughs> what happened here? What, and that, I think that's important. I think that's important because there are hundreds of kids who are in our schools and on one hand, they're saying one thing in school, and on the other hand, the parents and the family on a different page. So if you have a student in that situation, that's an opportunity for you to say, time out. I need to meet with my teacher and counselor and principal because the profile that the survey responses that my team provided and the kids that I'm living with every day, that's that they're the mismatch. And let's get on the same page. Yes, ma'am. So, how are you going to target the students that maybe don't have IEPs? Are you going to target their new Well, if they have an IEP, you should already be working towards their dreams and aspirations within the IEP. Um, every child, regardless if they have an IEP or they have a plan for different calendar, or generally speaking, kids who are in the middle, um, we need to make sure that we're, we're meeting their their goals. And so this profile will give us the opportunity to actually capture it, so then we know back, but back to what the gentleman said earlier, so are you going to make sure that it's used? He said, it's not enough to have a profile, we have to make sure we provide those, those Wednesdays for people can talk about it. We also want to utilize the time where these profiles are used during teaching care conferences, in an ideal, ideal world, I would love to have time where teachers and students and families are able to meet one another before school. If you have friends, you have children in other school districts, 
that week before or two weeks before school actually starts, it, it's more of a meet the teacher time. And it, it's a dedicated 20, 30 minute time period. You don't need more than 20, 30 minutes. And if you have that profile, the student can come in, set up their desk, get a tour of the classroom. You can have a one on one with the student and the family and the teacher. In an ideal world, we'll start moving in that direction. It's one thing to talk about social, emotional, mental health. It's another to create opportunity where that has to happen. And so those, those are some of the strategies, action planning that we'll be doing this time. So you mentioned um, high quality staff. Um, we had a lot of turnover, a lot of turnover by all the students in here, and I think just about every teacher we had was the um, I was really horrified because Jim lost money and just how many left right before school started. What is this district going to do to make it the best condition for the kids? Just how many really good teachers that left, and and how will what things look like right now. So it's not all money, but let me start with money. Our salary schedule is not competitive with other area school districts. And so when a school district calls in late August and says, I can offer you $20,000 more, um, I, I do not grudge an educator for saying, I'm going to leave. Again, it's not all, but when we when we get the data from staff members and they say, why are you just wrong? What's, what's bothering them, it starts with that. It starts with that compensation. This past year, we created a new teacher compensation system. In the past, we were dedicating about $400,000 um, to annual increase for teachers. We've increased that to $1.2 million. And that's just keeping us steady with the area. So what I would encourage, we know that our, our salary schedule is well behind um, other area school districts. And so that's one component. The second component is, and I think you've all seen the story on, on the news, there's a teacher shortage. And so principals and school leaders are making cold calls to educators to say, are you willing to come our way? So if there's money on the table that can increase the pay. People are going to go. The other component of it is, I think the school culture component of it. So I think when you look at our, our goal around culture and climate, we've had some challenges with behavior. We've had some challenges with what I would say behavior that in the past were very compliant behaviors are no longer compliant behaviors. In the past, you could make the, the, the assumption that in a school district like Walton Tulsa, 80 to 90 percent of the students will be compliant. And what I mean by that is if a teacher or an administrator says, please redirect your behavior, they did it the first time. They were compliant. That number in all school districts across the country has gone down. So the number of students who are compliant now, where it used to be 10 to 20 percent that are not compliant, that number now moved up. And depending on the school, that 10 or 20 percent could be more. And so teachers are making the decision, do I want to work in a district where, or a school environment where it's more to 20% or is it 30 to 40%? That, that's also the thing. We're trying to find the ways where we can bring that number down to turn the students who are not compliant. But the reality of it is every student has seen that number creep up. So that's another component to why people are making shifts. But I, I would, I, I, I want to be, um, I want to be realistic. While we see shifts, everyone in the metro area has seen shifts. We've seen you know, a lot of teachers make the decision. I'm going to be leaving the profession. During our opening day, where we had all the teachers in the West Auditorium, I asked the question: How many of you know someone, a fellow educator, who has either left the profession altogether? And everyone has to So I don't I, I don't want to isolate this to a wall of toes issue. Do we have challenges and strategies that we need to address? Absolutely. But when I talk to colleagues, this is a national problem that we need to get over. Yes. 
Um, with the, uh, are we going to be able to sustain being able to pay our teachers? It sounds like we increased the budget to the half of the times or so to be able to give our teachers more equitable pay. I heard you use the um, term, you know, help, help uh, describe this, but it's um, twice now, operational referendum. Um, is that, like, are we going to need to go to referendum in order to be able to generate more money and in order to pay our teachers? And, you know, I'm hearing this from, you know, some members of the board, members of the community. Um, I heard you use that term. Are we at a situation where we can sustain this for a year or two years? You know, um, where are we at? You can sustain. Budgeting is your value. It's just your value on paper. So can it be sustained? It can be sustained without having to go to work. It just means you're not going to have something else. So, so I, I don't want it. I don't. I, I'm not going to use the operational referendum language. Uh, from a budgeting standpoint, yes, it can be sustained. It just means we all have to be realistic and understand that we can't maybe do something else. So going back to Ms. Long's original question of we lost a lot of teachers. What are we going to do about it? Well, if we're committed to strategic goal number four, one of the components that they clearly stated that is an issue that the pay, and we know we, we I see the salary schedule in Elm World compared to ours. I see it. They pay more. I know it. You know it. And so if we want to keep people and not have them in a cold call. And say here's thirty thousand more. You have to put. You have to sustain that one point two million dollar. Then the board and I, the community, will have to decide. Well, are we are we going to stay within our our means, or are we going to try to generate more revenue? That that's a community conversation. I have a strategy. I have a, I have a philosophy around it. My philosophy is that. A school district should do everything it can to operate within the means that they have and demonstrate to the community you try everything before you go and ask for more money. And I don't think we've exhausted all of our all of our options. I don't even think we're close yet. So from a from a fiscal prudency standpoint, I think there's a there's still a road to go. Um, but just we should all keep in mind that road may be painful. You know, so if we if, if we're staying within the confines, that means you have to prioritize something because you can't do everything. So if we're prioritizing keeping staff, that may mean you don't have something else. But if you want to have everything, then it does cost it's like your it's like your homework. Yes. Give us knowledge, we need to plan for the plan for the students that are doing it as well. And to the point where the request is posted. And um, I don't blame her for my mom. She's graduating now, but I don't blame her because it's disruptive. So, if a plan issue, I think people would possibly stick it out. Pay comes secondary. When the environment is different. So, let's just, is there a strategic thing for that? So, step one is our new disciplinary framework. So, there's no question this is how we operate. Here are the rules. I don't think we've done what, we, what we've done poorly in the past if we haven't shared with parents and students. Here are the rules. And if you cross the line, there's, there's a consequence. So, that's step one. Step two, we have to start creating other options for students. What I mean by that is some students need alternative placements. Some students need maybe a break from the general population. So you learn a skill of handling the general population, and then you try it again. Um, and right now we don't have a lot of alternative placement options. So if, if student A is non compliant and is disrupting classes, we really don't have an off ramp for that student to go. And so that it creates the space of are, are you gonna we have the right to spend up you know, to 15 days if they're a regular resident and 10 days if they're special needs. And so you can spend them for 10 to 15 days. But then what are you gonna do with them? You have to are you gonna start expelling students? And I think the, the 
the fallacy that people don't understand with expulsion is that we still have an obligation as a school district to provide educational service to students. So just because we expel a student, they may be gone, but there's still a cost associated with the students. It's just not that they, they go away um, and, and they're gone forever. So I think there's a balance to the disciplinary piece that we have to keep in mind. Our new chief of people and family supports and containment, he's coming from Waukesha, the Waukesha school district, and he, he has been um, surprised by the lack of options that we have for students. He's been very surprised. And so in other words, when a principal calls and says, come on, and be that again, what the frustration is happening is the principal knows you can't you can't take them on anywhere. Um he, he's not even going anywhere. He can spit them for three days, but he comes back. And typically he comes back rested. He's going to be back rested, ready to go again. He's missing friends, he's he's ready, he's revved up again. And and what we lost and what we're not understanding is, yeah, he's spending them on for three days. But he's still not getting the skills that he needs to learn how to regulate himself. So, this is what in my mind is, is, a, is about teaching certain students how to regulate themselves, how to, how to handle a situation. And we haven't created those offerings or opportunities. We're, we're working on this right now. We're working on this. We're working on this. But it's involved money, right? So, that I means we're hiring alternative educators. Thing. We had to find space for, for those students there and different opportunities. And I think one of the reasons why maybe why we haven't had it explored more is because there is a cost associated with it. Yes. Some of the same question we have about speed and regulation, but one part of the time is not about the fact that the SCM is about that it's still supporting where the body of the so the question, Jamie, I'm following you, but that was a, it's probably the toughest question I've had so far. The question, Jamie, was when you look under, when you look under strategic plan or strategic goal number three, there isn't a lot of money associated with all of these very audacious things that have been listed under uh, strategic goal number three, which is social, emotional, and mental health. Where's the money coming from? Um, luckily, the governor has provided, Governor Beers has provided some funds for social and so mental health. Um, we are utilizing our ESSER dollars for the next two years around this work as well. Um, I'm really proud of our counselor at Madison Elementary School. He wrote an amazing grant for restorative um, practices, and we received that from the Department of Justice. Um, and so that's really exciting, but there will be, we're going to have to make room for these efforts um, soon. Yes, it's going to, it's going to, we can't, the thing about this plan is we can't talk the talk and not walk the walk. And this plan is not, I'm seeing some of my, my parents and friends here and not want to allow me to just talk about this. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to make some tough decisions even this to be so I, I think we're, we're going to have we're going to have to have some soft buddy conversations in the next few years that go back to the, the same that was made earlier, which is so where is the money coming from? I, I think this is, we can be aspirational, but this is my analysis is that this is uh, it's kind of like a house. That's why I use the house image. If you don't if you don't put money into your upkeep annually you get in order for a while but eventually there will be you're going to have to pay and we're we, we want a great house and, and and it's time for us to look at the bill um so i'm going to hold on that um the contract for the mou in the school district and the department has not been final is there any possibility the school resource officers are not going to be um, in our schools? I can't answer that right now. I mean, that's obviously a conversation that will 
take place between the board and the police department. So to be continued, I it would be premature for me to think of this bond right now. I, 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 one thing that I know for sure that currently right now, we're talking budget, right now we use money out of fund 80. That's our community service fund. People mistakenly call that a recreation department fund. We can fund the rec department out of fund 80, um, but it's, it's called in the state budgeting process, it's called community service fund. That's how we're paying for the $400,000 for school resource offices right now. I, I, there's certain language in the Department of Public Instruction that said you have to meet these components in order to use fund aid. And those components uh, include that uh, the school resource offices have to be available to all schools in the community. So in other words, the school resource office, all the training has to have those donated to go to REG. And check in at our review too, because it's a community service. Um, there's other components to the language that, that stipulates how you can use fund aid. I believe that one of a major component to that will be ensuring that we can utilize fund aid because, as we discussed, I don't know where we would find another $400,000 in our general fund. That would be a major hit. So using fund A makes a lot of sense, but we're going to have to adhere to the language that the Department of Public Instruction has stated we have to adhere to. Yeah, the second question. No, I wanted to look, I wanted to You want to digest it? Okay. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I want to make sure that I understand this. Um, when you guys talk about the uncertainty, the state budgeting process, how much does that impact the ability to distribute plan for all these goals? Not much at all. So, so he, here's why I I I think the most fun to Yeah, I'm, I'm so don't be surprised because ultimately we're gonna have to prioritize. And that's where I that's what I mean by it may be a tough road ahead. The question, Jamie, was a common theme uh, with this conversation that the DB has been money and funding. And so with the upcoming um, November 8th election and the next biannual budget being debated at the legislature um, for the 2023-2025 years, how nervous are we about having the ability to fulfill all of these goals? My response is, I'm not worried. Because ultimately, we're going to have to prioritize what we want to be. So it goes back to that mission statement. And so how, how much do we want it? And it may mean we can't do everything. Um, and we, uh, we'll have to prioritize everything. I will say that the state currently has a 5 to $7 billion surplus. So this is not a money issue. It's more of a philosophical issue in terms of how much we want to distribute to public schools. And I'm I, I'm I'm just a I'm just a superintendent. I'm not gonna get into politics. But there's money there. It's just a matter of how we want to, when I say we as the public wants to distribute. Um, I have a question and I have a follow-up. Um so you heard the community um talk about the, in the academic performance school that our students who take the um, forward test or the dynamic learning snap, the DLF test, the, in the academic performance school, there's nothing to capture the data for those students who take, the uh, students with disabilities who take the dynamic learning maps, the DLF. Yeah. So why weren't they included in there if this can they, you know, I'm asking, can they be included in them? Because how do we measure what we're doing when this curriculum being looked at, for example, and we're seeing we're having difficulties with um, math. And, and I just remember this when CMP was um, rolled out and the district invited everybody to come and learn about the new math program. And somebody had said, well, what about these kids who are taking alternate curriculum? How can their parents see this? 
And then at that presentation, we were told well, it's been over 10 years since that alternate curriculum has even been looked at. So why if we need if we need a hundred percent of students, why are we excluding this group? Can they be added? And um, I may have a follow-up. So my response, let, let me first explain to everyone what PML, PLM is. PLM is an alternative state assessment that's given to a very small percentage of our overall student population. Uh, anywhere between one to two percent of all of our students take the PLM. Uh, these are students who have severe cognitive ability issues and that and so we the state has said here is an alternative assessment. A concern we have uh, with that utilizing that assessment is that if we utilize it and track it, likely you will be able to know what student is actually taking the DLM. Who are we talking about in the performance? So the the the, the, the sample size will be so small and in each individual school or even district wide, you'll know who those students are, and that's a concern that we have in terms of not identifying students. That's the answer. So that it's unfortunate because then how are you going to track? So the special education director special education can still utilize the TLM data to talk about the performance of the special education department. That doesn't that's not exclusive to this strategic plan. So I, I, I would respectfully say that when we're talking about one to two percent maybe of our entire student population, I just don't want to identify those students when we start aggregating the data. Because part of what we're going to do is look at DLM data at Roosevelt, DLM data at Whitman. We're going to start when you start looking at uh, the data from that small example scale, you're looking at maybe three to five students. People will know who those three to five students are. I don't want to expose them. That's a major factor behind it. I, yeah, I don't know how people would know that. Because if we're looking at less than two percent. They think they, they were. I think they were. 240 kids in the district with about 7,000 children. And it's, so can you just have it on the dashboard as all of them? You know, instead of separating it out by school, so people can see how are we doing with this. Um, I mean, I have a student who takes the TLM. She reads our fifth grade with three of them. You know, so um, and performs math about that. Like she didn't need her math book. And as I look at this, what's written here, IEP service for proper measurement. So are we even tracking who's not meeting their goals? Absolutely. But where, where does the community see in a large format? You know, 80% of students with diabetes did not meet goals, or whatever the percentage is, so that we can address this. Because I feel that it's just not right that we have, I, I get what you're saying, that it's right. separated out by schools. But if we took, 70 to 240, however many kids there are, what's 2%, and put it as here's the stats because doesn't TPI, TPI puts that out there, right? So, okay, per district, you know, per your, district. Yeah, so why can't we have that on our dashboard to not so specific down to third grade at Rosenbach, you know, or whatever, but put that out there because otherwise we don't feel included. Well, but I, I, would, I would respectfully say that, that when we look at our strategic plan and how we help with this students with special needs, it is, I, would, I would encourage you to go out to any other school district's strategic plan and, and, and try to see how we compare. I, 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 I can't go to district. I, 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 and I think that, so, but I would just, I would ask for some breaks as when you look at our plan, I think we, we there have been a lot of requests that have come from certain corners of the district, and we've met them in terms of special needs and making sure special needs students are represented in the plan. I think they are. Um, if there's a, this is another request that has come forward. Do we know it? Please allow us time to reflect on it. But my initial response would be 
I'm really concerned about the identification of those students individually. But we, I, I don't, I would just respectfully say, I think we, we, we can try to meet the needs of the plus that have come our way. We, we have that. And so I, I'm not quite, and, 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 and I guess what I'm, what I'm really interested in knowing is, what, what is, what do you, what, what's the goal, right? I mean, where, where are we, because it, it feels like the goal continues to move. And so if there's a definitive goal, of a definitive request, we can respond to those things, but it's really hard to respond to a way it continuously shifts. Well, it continually shifts. I think that when we talked about this in a couple other meetings, the special ed parents have not felt hurt for a lot of years. So you put all this great stuff up, but we're guarded. Because we want to see our kids, we want to see the needle move. And like I've had a student on an IEP since he was three, and it has not moved. So I would say to you, and my husband had said, let's take them off. Let's save you some money. Because if we're really not looking at a plan that's working for the child, or isn't moving, or the goals aren't measurable, and we're not seeing progress, then we're wasting your money and you're wasting my time. So I guess that's kind of where parents are kind of at. Like, I think it's great that you have included us. Right. Thank you. Because we haven't been helped. Right. But we're guarded still. And we're still, like, we've been, we have been promised things and things have not been ever received. And so I've had some hard conversations with folks. I appreciate all the new staff and the challenges that they have and what they're faced with. But we need to see progress. I have a son in sixth grade who is... We, they don't even know what level he's at, and that's not okay. You've been on an IEP since you were three years old, and it's just in this district the whole time, and we don't know. He started at zero percent this year with, an, with follow up IEP to come because we don't have any measurable data on him. That's just one child, and I'm one loud voice. I worry about the parents that send their kids to school. And the idea is that we're doing it great in Tosa, and I think most of the time we are doing great things. But what about the parents that aren't as loud as me and aren't asking the right questions or are just trusting the school that they're doing the right thing? And then you look at it and you think, wait a second, a kid can't read very well, can't do math very well. So I think Deb and I are, we see this opportunity with all this new staff, and you're a new set of ears. Right. And I, and I appreciate the dialogue. I would just ask that. So the dialogue is a compromise and collaboration in two ways. And, and I think we've demonstrated in one year that we're listening. There are structures in place that, that demonstrate that we're listening. Candidly, the way that an IEP works is that if the goals aren't being met annually, my question to a family would be, so who and we, I've had this conversation with the two of you. Right. I, then that's a systemic problem that should have been addressed before the mom means a lot. So, so, so we're going to just talk brass facts. The reality of it is the IEP process is one in which there are goals identified every year. And if you're sitting down with the case manager and for three years in a row, progress is going to be made. Then you should have the ability to go to that supervisor, that, that IDK manager boss, which is the principal, or the person who is above the principal, which is the director of special education. We have that structure in place where you can have those conversations and something will happen. I am so sorry that that wasn't the structure before. I, I'm, I'm actually against that that wasn't the structure, but I will take your word for it that that's not what, what happened. But when you have an IEP, you have something that's actually different and unique from other students because you're meeting with an case manager that every year saying, are we making progress or are we? Either on the TLM or on the other goal that has been set on that plan. And if that's not happening, that's a reflection of the staff and the principal that's So we're aligned. I'm aligned with everything you want. And so, what is 
it's not about the DLM and the score of the DLM, but what percentage of IAP goals are next out of all the IAP goals? I think that's something that's valuable and can be part of a lot of stuff. And actually, I think that this new service delivery better than the DLM score. Yeah, and that's that's true. That's what I mentioned. Is that is it eighty percent? Is that something that I can put be put on the dashboard? It can be part of the milestone. Or the milestone, yes. That district wide X percent of IEP goals are met. You know, so we can dig in deep and look at that data and see is it that? Is it meeting that we're having problems in? You know, like which types of goals are being met? I need that goal. I need that milestone as well because. I am as disappointed as you. So I, I want to be very clear. I share your disappointment. I came to this district that I told you we are alive. I have to say every year. And so I think that's a better way of capturing uh, the productivity and movement, forward movement of a special education department versus DLM. DLM is just going to capture our state. A seventy four for a certain amount of kids. The 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 percentage of IEP goals met for all students with special needs who have an IEP, that's a different, that's a pretty powerful metric. That's a pretty powerful metric. So we say 80% of all goals. Now I want to make sure it's, I want to be careful and I want to get more thoughts to it. I don't want you know, our staff to lower the bar for the goal, right? So I don't want that to happen either. You know, I, I want them to reach for good goals, but I, I think that I think that, and I'm I'm asking you more than anything else. You don't have to respond now, but I think that actually addresses what you're asking for. Well, that's probably well, I agree with that. And you know, as we talked about disproportionality and these achievement gaps, you know, it, like, are we lessening the gap for students with disabilities? Right. And how are we measuring? I like that much. Well, chew on it. You got to chew on it. I'll continue to explain that I think that's a better, that's, that's a more measurable milestone. Unless my next one wants to Then you can really see where the brain dots were. Is it a certain case manager? Is it a certain principal? Is it a certain building? Right. Is it a manual curriculum that's not working for our kids with special ed? But right now we don't know. Exactly. You get that frustration. If it's a math curriculum, sure. or a human curriculum that doesn't serve, then you can kind of read the belly. Right now, it's just a black hole. I'm just doing it. And I have to ask for the frustration. Yeah. I, I don't know. Let's keep doing it together. But that's where I would land. I would land on more of what percentage of people are being that angle. My only challenge with that one also. Again, let's let's think about it together and collaborate on it. I don't like annual goals. I like being able to check the quarter. Um, that, I, I just I think when when it's an annual goal, that people forget. For a lot of time goes by a year, but that it's it's. So there, may be, there should be a way for us to check it quarterly too. Yes. Um. So kind of talking about all of that stuff, so, and also talk about the different and social. I have spent a lot of time talking to you about this. I've talked to the CP and FOT. We have so many great ideas. I feel like they do know what we need for the most part. And I've had this weird perspective because we started the enrollment and IP process for some years the last team and then we transitioned so we kind of see the difference a little bit um but i still obviously see areas of improvement how are they getting all of the administrative goals down so that i actually see them when i'm talking to my kids case manager or the principal or the counselors or whoever's on his team and in the buildings i know there's some external trainings um, is it built into the professional development? Are they going to? Oh, yeah, I mean, what what kind of work is getting done for that I actually see? So I think you just solidified the goal, the, the new milestone that the Paul Calic has created. Um, <laughs> Uh, and that's what I like it. I, I think the goal of creating a milestone that says 
X percentage of our students are meeting their IEP goal, feels like it's more of a department of balance of milestones. And it also allows for us to, to desegregate the data from a district, school, and individual standpoint. You can then select it from curricular area. So I think it's really powerful. We have four people who are identified as special education coordinators. So those people are assigned to being the leaders. I think they were called diagnostician um, prior. We changed the name to special education coordinator because that's what they really do. Their job is to help coordinate the work that special education teachers are doing at the school. So if you have a child at Longfellow, Obviously, you're working with the teacher at that long though, but there's a coordinator who's assigned to long though to make sure that there's no gaps. And even if there's a gap there, then they're still facing clear. So I think we have a, a stronger structure um, in team. And to to Deb's point earlier, the bottom. I'm not. I was never a special education teacher, but my sister was a special education. And the key is those those goals in that IEP is golden. I mean that's that's no joke. That's a legal document. I used to always say when I was a principal, this is a legal document. You shall, as a classroom teacher, you shall follow it. This is not optional. I don't know if the messaging has gone out that way. And so you need to know that we have a team that will that they are delivering the message that way now. Um and uh, Let's keep chewing on it. I, I'd like to be able to identify how many of those goals are we actually need. You know, then that shows how effective we've been. Yes. So there's a lot here to digest. And we talked about priorities. And in the ideal world, all of these goals would be met. And we have all these resources to be ideal. Um, but we're gonna have data, and that's great. But in the hands of someone with ulterior motives, data can be massaged. Ever, and I heard the most the most effective, the most effective way to prevent that is a basic control system of feedback. Right. What's the feedback? From the community to say, hey, this is what the data says. There's a feedback loop to the input to change the system to get the output to what the actual desired output is. Yes. So, these are the milestones that we were discussing earlier, and we'll have to try to find out. I would hate to create an 11th goal that I don't want our students with special needs to be an 11th. Milestone, but there there has to be a way I, we can incorporate those those IEP milestones under two and three, for example, um, or two, three, and four. So I want to come back to that, or one through four. I think that's I think that's the way to do it. So that again, I want my 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 colleagues and and and. Folks who are advocating on the special ed side and think about that. I think that's where we incorporate it. But let's see here. To answer your question, Todd, the question was: so how do we know this is happening? And and how are we going to make sure that the data is not massaged? And, and, and how is there insurance that if the once we get this first set of data and oh, okay. Either are or are not meeting the goal. What's the feedback loop to back to the input to say, hey, there needs to be a change? So this is different. The question is how, how are we going to measure if we're doing the job or not? So a difference from the past strategic plan to this one is that this will be a public-facing dashboard. And it will either be green, we're meeting our mark. Yellow, we're kind of there, or red, we're not. We will also have quarterly updates that will be presented at a board meeting where the data is shared. So there's no, it, 
there's no hiding the data. Yes. So the reason I asked you to go back to the strategic plan, item number two. Um, I had the day there were so many versions of it that went around the language that changed quite a bit. So I asked after it was approved for a copy, and um, the description that had sent me what's on the website. Um, I just wanted to see if what's on the website is the final product or what is up here is the final product because a lot of that language is different. Okay. So, what part of goal number two are you? There was, initially, it was um, non-white students, and then I believe um, school board member Jessica Willis changed it to black and brown students. And then was on the website as Native American. I had asked Asian students, like, why we went from non-white to black and brown, and then it had a lot of difference. Um, it has LGBTQA in here. I know you were asking for students. That's the one I wanted. That's the one you wanted. Um, so I, I want to make sure that it's consistent. I see some areas where it's on white, some where it's black and brown, some where. There was, there, was there was a motion by a board member to create more inclusive language that captured everyone. That, I don't think that that's in here, but I can pull up the. So on our website, we have the plan here, and let's take a look at the language that you're referencing. So I think you're speaking of strategic objective goal or strategic uh, objective 2.1. So this is language that the board accepted as their final language to be to to not point out certain groups of, but to be more inclusive of all. Mm -hmm. okay. And, but this version that I had read. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. No, that's okay. It just it back. Right. Wanted to see what we did. So. Yes, ma'am. So where it says immediately begin to implement strategy to programs, are there KPIs for that? Like the media told me, no. In what programs? So our director of diversity and inclusion is starting the process of increasing increasing representation of staff and staff or students and staff in the area of our district. So I think it, it ranges from, from special education, excuse me, from uh, um, gifted and talented. I think we had a presentation just last night where we saw that our gifted and talented program is 2%, 2 to 3% of our students and gifted and talented are students of, of African-American descent. Um, when we look at our our student government. I, I think those are the immediate actions that are taking place. So we could talk with the director of the diversity and inclusion about the immediate implementation of strategies and programs for students, for example, with facilities. Uh, since this principal now says immediately begins to implement, then we start working on that. I, I I would say yes. I would also caution you to be prepared 
that that person may have to prioritize. There's a lot of different student groups in this description. So I would just ask that we make sure that we prioritize and, and allow that person to prioritize which groups are in the greatest area of need for I didn't I didn't I didn't use the word rank. Well, I know, but it doesn't right? because it prioritize people. Well so, but we have to prioritize the work. So I think that's where the balance comes into play again with a strategic plan. You can't do everything at once. And and so while you have this very noble strategic objective, I, I can't imagine our director of diversity and inclusion doing everything at once. I think what will happen is that that person, to answer the question thoroughly, what that person will do is take a look at our disproportionality data and look at where the disproportionality is. Are we seeing? So if you want to talk about special education, I think one of the components of, we talked about this before, one of the components of disproportionality with special education is the override education of student color in special education. To the point where the state of Wisconsin said, well, it's only you identify too many kids of color in special education. So, I, I yes. There's a lot of overlap between special ed and students of color. And there are, there and, are. And right that's why I, I advocate so hard to include, add that group on, you know, black and brown students and students with disabilities, because there's so much overlap and you can't look at these groups. So what I what I would assume is going to happen to the director of diversity inclusion and inclusion that she will take a look at all the disproportionality data in our district and say where is the greatest area of need and, and not and not in terms of rankings but to truly identify where is the greatest area of need. Can you just say my so there's a yeah, great question. So the, the question to Jamie was so what data are you looking at? Uh, well, this person or individual look at. So there's discipline data we take a look at. There's a, there's a great question. There's chunks of data we look at. We look at discipline data. We look at the performance data on standardized assessments. We look at the number of students who are participating in clubs or activities. You know, the, the research tells us that if you're in a club or activity, you're going to do better in school. And, and so what we recognize is that there's certain Certain student groups are in activities, and certain student groups are not. Um, and then we look at representation in certain classes. So those are the four major chunks of data that we take a look at and say, well, where's the disproportionality? Where, where are we seeing a lot of variance? And then that's what we start addressing. Okay. We put action in place. Yes. Dr. Means, if it's okay. Dr. Means, if it's okay, I just wanted to mention to our virtual attendees that if you do want to ask a question, please use the raise hand feature oh, yeah. in the Zoom client, yes. and I can enable the mic for you. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, now you have a question. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, you're saying about how students would do better in school if they're activities and so, what exactly do you mean by that? So, there's been a lot of research that shows that if a student is engaged in after school or what I call co curricular activities, be it student government or theater or a sport, that the research shows that those students persist and are better uh, and they, they perform better academically. And the logic behind it is if you have to manage multiple things at once, you, you're, you're better organized, you're focused more, and, and that activity also gives you unique leadership opportunities. So that's what the research says to us about those co-curricular opportunities. Yes. So that's the for me, I know that I'm a student and so I wouldn't say it was necessarily for 
it wouldn't necessarily like help with the organization I think you're coming from, but like what exactly do you say about organization? Because I I know that when it comes to people that are frantic and poor and city council, um, it may not be exactly the case. So so I would say that you're gifted and skilled and you don't even know it. So the fact that you're you're speaking in this forum and you're coherent and clear, that's a skill that most people don't have. That's number one. Number two, the balancing of being in those activities after receiving a, a volume of homework, that takes a lot of activity and a, a lot of management to balance the two, because you can't sustain and be remaining on those activities unless you're doing well academically. So that that's the research that if you can balance all those different things that we, there's this, uh, this, this one study that shows that most CEOs of corporations can go back, you can trace back and see that they were part of whole curricular activity in high school. And then that that skill or those skills help them persist to the place that they, they're in today. I'm not suggesting that everyone has to be a CEO, but with the research shows that when you can balance those things, uh, you're you're you have a better sense of self, you are more confident, there's just a lot of bad. Um research L G A Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, is there, is there a question? Or, oh, uh, I'm actually pointing because I there's like seven trains there as well. Yeah. <laughs> well point, yes. You mentioned increasing the hiring of non by employees by a certain percentage every year. What happens if that conflicts with the other major goal, which is to hire the best staff possible for all So what if the five percent is not achievable? Which one is the priority? Priorities. Uh, we're not going to hire people because of who they are. We want them to be high quality staff. So that's why I'm asking. If five percent is not achievable in a certain circumstance, it could happen. I, I don't want to presume that it can't happen either. I don't. Know. Right. I'm saying it could. If that situation happens, we're focused on the best and the brightest for our students. And then, in addition, if we can also hit that goal, that becomes a priority second. Or is it, you see what I'm saying? No, I don't. What I think that maybe a personal answer to that. If you look at the, some of the um, the specific action plan items of the diversity, equity, and inclusion, you're gonna, there's going to be required training, more training, more teacher involvement so that they can better understand the goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that can help if, if for some reason the new staff doesn't meet the Percentage that you have set up for BIPOC people, then at least the people who are coming on will be better trained and have more experience. But I don't want to presume no. that hiring people of color will be is a, is a, is a primary driver, and the second driver, secondary driver is high quality. Okay. Right. I, I think that's, that's the point you're trying to make. You're using that those could, in theory, be in conflicts. Possible, and I want to make sure there's clarity of that. If there is zero sorry, magic, zero applicants of non white, and you're saying, Well, we have a goal of five percent, what we can do? I just hope they stand for that, right? This is not about an affirmative action statement, it is leading as I'm saying, it is. It is we believe that we can hire high quality staff who are also diverse. Okay. And, and that and we're not and they're both primary drivers. One is not primary, one is not secondary or tertiary. They're both primary drivers. Right? They're not in competition with one another. Yes. I don't know if this question is but so are you relying on the people that are hiring that are diverse? To bring the diversity, or are you including all your staff? Is there a plan based on how that includes all of your staff and kind of um, educating and alerting instead of assuming that the 
um, diverse staff that you want to bring out to you that point or not, would bring the diversity, would bring the inclusive knowing how, the know how. Um, because it can't assume that those of uh, a diverse background will know how to engage that or in, in a, are interested or right. know how to engage it. So are you um or do you guys have some sort of thing in place that kind of um I don't know if it's there, but it kind of helps everyone to understand what that means because um it can be confusing because like we have to make it what it means. Yes, there is a objective I think it's objective 2.2 require ongoing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. That was a thank you, Deb, for that one. We we added that one, right? Um, so that that is um, we talk about training and monitoring that implementation throughout for all staff. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. Chooses that are required training courses, length of time. All of that Our director of uh, di director of diversity and inclusion will choose which courses we offer, the duration, who offers it. That will be. That was not necessarily a for a committee, or did? It... Well, there will be a diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility committee, and that that but the director will bring forth recommendations and move forward and keep that committee updated. Are they recruiting for that committee already? Like, is that being worked? Why not? So, I think, I think, yeah, I, I think, the, I think the, the recruitment process for a number of different committees will start. I, I'm really happy that people are excited about the opportunities for engagement. Um, and again, I, I like to point out how we've actually expanded the opportunities for, so, so it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, so we've opened up the opportunities and now people are really revved up to do it, and that's good. Um, and I would just ask that we, we keep in mind, it, these people started July 1st. And so when you think about starting July 1st, and, and I know for some of you who've been waiting for a while, you're like, I don't care. <laughs> and I get it. But I would just ask that you give, give, give them some, some time. Um, and, and, and again, and I also say I'm, I'm being humble and respectful because if you've been sitting on a bad experience for years, it's hard to hear someone say, well, they just started July 1st. You want some action. And I think the other component to it is when you get a glimpse of how they're different and how we can be different, you get even more anxious. And so I understand, and, and I think that's a good, I think that's a good positive energy that we have. I, I think in the next month or so, we're going to start rolling out invitations to the community for, you know, these external needs. The speaker, I think the 5% we're right now. I don't know. And then as far as the disproportionality, um, where do we have that data, or is that data that? Oh, we have it. We have for yes. those four big chunks, discipline, yeah. student performing for the stuff we have it. We know what it is. We know. Well, for which group? Which for all of the We we know for all of our groups. So we so so again, we talk about the four major areas: discipline, student performance, and state assessments. Um, we, we take a look at activities uh, and co-curriculars. Or is representation important? And stating what type of course. We know what those four, what, what this role uh, is in those four areas. We know, we know right now. We, we, one of our, I'll, I'll keep speaking some insider information. So last school year, we had a researcher from the, from Vanderbilt University come in. He's a well respected author. Um, he said that he gives. You know, species of school that's all over the country and what that data that constantly before he states that our disproportionality data in those four major areas was some of the most stark data we see nationally. So so if if you are a student, if you're a, a certain student, you're generally thinking you're doing well in all of them. 
but they're the they're the sliver of kids who being in special needs students or uh, you name it there are certain kids who are not doing well and everyone organizationally was aware of it that's why this is the strategic plan i've heard people use the terminology as aggressive yes it is because i think we have a aggressive thing for us um that we have to address. I think open moment because again I don't want to like end up on the open moment people, but when we see when we see that when we see them included, when we see them in activities, I mean you might live across town and this is your school. So are you going to activities? Are you going to the clubs? Do you need a moment? Right. And I think I don't know if they know about it. I don't know what they Yes. The question was, are open enrollment students uh, for our virtual uh, listeners, do they know that they can be included as well? Um, and do they know that there's access and, and resources? And I think they've been on somewhat of a breakdown of communicating to them what's available to them. Yes, ma'am. More factual in high school age students. If we're when is the campus? It's everywhere. It's like it's, starting to say that's not what I'm yes. well, it's all, it's all it, it starts in elementary and continues to grow as it matriculates. So the question was where is the disproportionality located? Is it mainly high school or the middle school? We see it grow throughout the district. But as it matriculates through, it gets worse and worse. And I think that there's a corresponding behavioral issue. That happens as well, as you mentioned earlier. So when you have a, a student, regardless of who they are, they will hit that freshman year in high school and say, This isn't for me. But I'm really good at disrupting class. I'm that's a skill I have. And so that's why we talked about earlier that profile. I would rather have a profile that says, Demond has leadership skills, now it's negative. He's, he's using it in a, in a negative way right now, but he has the ability to turn students around. If we didn't have a program that saw the skills and gifts of all students, maybe we pull the mind to the side and say, the mind is never getting in class to turn a different teacher. Why don't we put you in a leadership program? That's the, that's the power of a profile system. Yes. So to your point about the One thing that's done starts the classroom. Mike is one of those. Chris from elementary school to middle school to high school, just overall, a significant drop in participation of that teacher. When you notice, like when I was in elementary school, I would go to it was a struggle to find a block that was open and work from a schedule. Junior high, I was going to get involved. There's a ton of times available. I got my big high school. I mean, I'm one of a handful of parents on most nights, or every one of my kids' teachers. Um, how much visibility does the district have on that? What can be done to try to get more parents at those older levels? I mean, it's seemingly there's more discipline on at levels. Right. It, it just seems to me that higher parent teacher conference participation might take a little bit of a chunk out. So, yes, and I would go back to the profile. Um, I would also go back to, so I would look at 1.6 in regards to the profile. I think that's really important. Um, I would also go to 1.5. 1.5, the, the subcommittee that worked on academic performance was adamant about 1.5. They felt that we are doing a really poor job in communicating with families around student learning. And so I, I think that's a really strong objective. So I think that will address it. Uh, but I'm trying to get to...
Sí. I really think that 1.3 provides us some opportunity as well. And what I mean by 1.3 is perhaps we're doing high school wrong. Perhaps the way that we're currently, so I want us to analyze our district school program and classroom data along with student performance and continuously plan, study, and adjust programs and practice. So maybe we're doing high school not in a way that isn't dangerous. Yeah, we're doing high school the way that we did in 92. Maybe our middle schools are not really structured in the way that middle schools should be structured. Maybe because I, as a former middle school principal, I like to always say it starts in the middle. So that's when they start, that's when students start exploring who they are. And we should, middle schools should feel like a one in between high school and elementary, but it shouldn't feel like a junior high. And I think sometimes our, our, our middle schools aren't, they don't feel like true middle schools. Um, I'm, a, I'm a strong proponent if you research what a middle school is, it's very eclectic and open and it'll allow students to explore. I, I don't like the, it, it, sometimes when middle schools feel more like high schools, I, I think it's uncomfortable. So I think to answer your question, that, I think we, we addressed it in 1.3, we addressed it in 1.5 with communication, we addressed it in 1.6. That's why, so the subcommittee, and there are a lot of members of the steering committee here tonight. The, the steering committee, the subcommittee for one, for academic performance was intense. They, did, they were very explicit in making sure that this stuff happened and that the language was such that there wasn't just going to be talk, but there would be changes in our academic program. Is there a way of keeping us coordinating this whole policy? Or you can correlate that screen name as this academic performance that these co curriculars, the parents do or do not show up for the academic performances, kind of amalgamate that with some. That says, okay, that's not this kid. Right. Versus, okay, that's not this kid. I think that you have to start with an organizational mindset of thinking that way. We're there now. We're going to start. So, just having the structure. So, the question for the virtual leaders or, uh, and, and participants was is there a way for us to take the data that demonstrates? Who is attending teacher parent conferences? Who is struggling academically? And is there a bit, is there a big diagram? Is there a, a meeting of the um, And yes, but I think it started with us creating an infrastructure where we're collecting data to say who's showing up and who's not showing up. Um, and we're going to start collecting that data more with an intentional lens. Not just business. We're just not gonna, we're we're gonna have to let the data to say so that we can look at it. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um so there are parents that won't participate in at a certain age they may say they can hold them and they rely on the teacher, whatever the teacher gives the student, they can go for it. And so there are gonna be parents that just won't just is there something that you guys have in case or have you considered? Um um Putting something in the hands of the student to advocate for themselves. Because at junior high and high school, they're going to need those schools anyway to start advocating for themselves if their parents are going, is it going to be as great in their um, education or on their way out? Um, does the school have a way to help the students be well because the parents are going to um, put that in their own hands? They're going to make those schools. We haven't thought about it that deeply. So to answer that question, the question was, is there some strategy or mechanism that the district has in place that can safeguard for students who don't have parental or home involvement to continue to progress and move for, in a positive manner academically? And, and, and I, I think it, that is the holy grail that what do you do with a child who still has skills and has aspirations, but they don't have the support? 
Um, I, I think a lot of that is, will be in goal three with our social, emotional, and mental health and the relationship building that we want to achieve, but we have not thought about it in, in that granular level of, of, a, of a strategy. It seems like it would kind of go back to the university of things where you say there's some major concern. Um, if that person who's in place can help the child advocate for themselves, because a lot of people in that space don't always have parents, their ways would be the mouthpiece for them. And really, that is huge to help a child advocate for themselves, give them power. And even if your parent is not involved or as involved as they need them to be, um, you see behavioral changes, not only behavioral changes, it's all and so they're giving them something, okay, here's how you can have for yourself. Here's how you can kind of take a look at what's working for you, what's not, versus I told you, I told you, I told you. After a while, you know, the students check out and the teacher or the staff is, is exhausted. Great comment. I, it's, I think this is the, the, the flaw in our work with the strategic plan. It, it's a three year plan and it doesn't cover everything. Um, and, and so we want to come back to it. What I would share with you, what I'm sensing from this group tonight and what I've seen since I've arrived, there's a passion and a, and a urgency that most people have around wanting their this food to be the very best it can be. And again, I would ask, it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, we, we didn't arrive here overnight. Um, and it's going to take some time to regenerate our our focus to be the type of district that everyone aspires to be. Yes. Um, so, kind of to your point, um, so Um, made a comment that maybe we'll do a full run of the people. I hope that I've demonstrated over the last year that's not how I operate. So I like to engage people. Um, I'm a former social studies teacher. So social studies teachers are trained in strategy around problem-based learning or challenge-based learning and how do you bring people together and you challenge them, but at the same time, you allow them to create organically. I do believe that it's appropriate under 1.3 to talk about, so how are we structuring our middle and high school? Are we achieving the goal that we want um, in those spaces, are we structured the way that we need to to, to keep teachers energized and students energized, and to make sure that parents feel like they're still part of the process? That's a big. That's my job is to kind of push the organization, the community, and asking those big questions, and then giving you a, a platform and giving people the ability to facilitate and have those discussions. But what I would say if you're looking for demand perspective i think there there's an opportunity for us to re-examine what we do yes i want to understand the numbers and what you were saying yeah um i think it has given us a lot of i don't um i think there's also in my opinion a big disconnect between what happens here in these sessions and that's, that's huge. Um, and I think, you know, the vision of a graduate, I think some of these pie in the sky concepts versus what are we doing to set kids up for success once they leave the school district. I would love five year data on what kids are doing once they leave the school district and how we set them up for success, real life skills, advocating for themselves, 
um, because we've seen kids who have fallen through fall the cracks within the school district that what in particular last year that was one of the biggest issues that happened at West. Um, why did that, that child fall through the cracks the way he did? And nobody picked up on what was going on with him that led to an incident at West. Um, I want to make sure that we are not having these high in the sky concepts that come through the board and we are actually setting students up for success after the school Because it's just this you know, random things rather than these key elements to make sure that we are making sure that whatever the path of the student is going to follow is set up for success. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think we've done that a lot of kids too, which find some of the things that we can do. So I would talk in generalities. So yes, and school boards across the state are going to need people's support and ensuring that there are resources. So if we don't want kids to fall through cracks, then you have to make sure that there are enough counselors and social workers available so they don't fall in between cracks. If you don't want kids to misbehave, it's not as simple as saying behave. Some kids need to be taught how to behave, and there are ways that we can teach those skills, but that costs money. Uh, and it takes, we can find the time. That's the easy part of it. It's the, the, it's the funding that's going to really be critical in the next few years. And so the, the exciting part of all of these conversations I've been having in the community is that we clearly all want the same thing. And, and and there may be, and it's natural when you have public engagement and a public enterprise of a public school system, there's going to be a lot of different ideas. That's healthy. But I do believe that everyone wants the same thing. So if we, I, I would share with you this. Please know we want to do this work together and how we continue to collaborate and talk to each other in a way where it's open, that we're not holding down ideas. I think a great example of that was tonight, where we created another, we, we've embedded another model cell with our IEP goals. That, that's what, that's how I like to operate in game games with people. When we do it that way, I think we have to come up with a better conclusion and product for kids. Because this is not about adults, it's really about the students. And so, we can listen to one another and, and play off of one another and utilize the great minds that are in this room so, so we can achieve what we all want. And, and I'm very optimistic that that, that will happen for us. I will stick around, but it's almost 8 o'clock. Um, if you have additional questions, we'll do this again. Um, but more importantly, I promise the steering committee. And I promise the community that that quarterly update data will be shared public. So this is this is not a strategic plan that we're going to put on the shelf and then it goes away. So quarterly, we're holding ourselves responsible. And the fact that we decided that it's going to be a three-year plan, I think, shows you that we're we're about moving in a very urgent and uh, expedient way. December. We'll have data up um, in December. And so we'll be able to we'll bring the steering committee back together and you guys can sit down and say what we're doing well and where we need to step up. Because if, if you believe we continue to improve in everything, it will never always be good. If we believe we continue to improve, there's always adjustments we need to make. But I would just say let's embrace those adjustments in, in a growth mindset perspective. Yes. Um, one of the more polarizing things that happened recently is the human growth development process. Is that built in the human plan? No, it's not. Okay. That's, 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 that's why I wanted to ask. Yeah, no, that's that's a different version. That's not our student. Yes, sir. So on that thing, we talked about being inclusive. Yeah, we're not uh, necessarily on board with certain uh, lessons is to opt out. How, how does the district feel that that's interesting? 
what I so I'm not trying to be snarky. My question would be, so what what the alternative? So so I, I understand the frustration that you point out. What would you suggest is an alternative that we consider? Well that was discussed on August twenty second about adding alternative lessons and not just like it along the sure and then that turned into a whole it did. Into this random way. I mean that would so so do you think that, that would be a solution yes. to some of the yes. pushback that if there were like yes. parallel or jobs yes. available and then people would have the ability to select? Yes. That's interesting. Okay. I, I just if you're gonna walk the walk without being an inclusive district, you can't just say like it or bump it and opt out at times. In my mind, the twin is right. They're saying they're going to that data. Yes, and in the disclosure, and see what percentage of our kids actually opt out. Opt out. Just, you know, I'll there make it like XYZ kid over here. How do you not make them feel marginalized for the choice, depending on who makes the choice of the parent? Is better? How does that process happen? Because there's typically a form that goes on to so okay, and the end of the day of like in the classroom, how do we to your point, I don't know if there's depending on the disposition of the child, I don't know how we can for some students, I don't know how to avoid them not feeling isolated because to God's point, maybe a majority of the students. When I think the majority, if you're in a class of 25 students and 22 decide to take the curriculum, if you're one of the three, you may feel isolated. I, but what I would share with you is that when I was a middle school principal 25 years ago, there were three students out of the class 25 that chose not to be part of the curriculum 25 years ago. When I took human growth and development 40 years ago, there were three students who chose not to be part of that curriculum. I think this is something that when you look at districts across the state that do teach human growth and development, you will always have that certain, there will be a percentage of families who will choose to not have their children go through that curriculum in a public school setting. It is, we have to all acknowledge that talking about a human growth and development curriculum in a public school setting is extremely complicated and it's complex and there are a lot of different emotions and family values that we need to honor. Will we ever have the alternate materials for our kids with um, disabilities who needs, you know, we've heard a lot of it, it just wasn't a big deal. And we have materials from 1988. And so nowhere was it reviewed. And I just don't think that's right. You know, that we didn't just go through and look at the two curricular materials we have to say, is there anything more current? Um, that's better to use. Um, it's, you know, that's my issue with the curriculum is that. But I think you spoke with Dr. Marvel about this process. And she, she didn't respond to it. Um, I thought she you said that with her. No, no. Um, no, I came and looked at it. And, um, but nowhere was it looked at. So I'm just saying. Can this be done? Can there be a group of people that looks at? I mean, I looked at this stuff. It's in 1988, and you say well, we can't. No one has evidence that they looked at the curriculum for these children with disabilities. Who again? This is some of the most vulnerable group of children when it comes to. I you see no other issues. I don't understand the statement. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming it's for. No, you can list it all. It's for like the external committee. And the internal committee had to look at the curriculum. So no, this is what we already had, because I actually reached out and said, what is the curriculum? So are you making that assumption that they just simply rolled over for I think they forgot. 
Um, and okay. you know, I do think we have to look at this. I think yeah, we double check and ask again. I would never under that. So, I think that's pretty So, it was explained to parents people that were in the committee that they just, there, there wasn't something that might fly that they were going to use the, what they had. Because the applicants for youth and it's not frequently asked questions if they don't have anything set up for stuff led. And the other thing that kind of bothers me is we don't have pre and post post test. We don't know is does this curriculum really serve our students? There's no data on this yet. Um are kids better for going through this? Do they what are they learning? Is is there job better at this topic? And I think there's also a real disservice to compare this um, comprehensive sex education to human growth and development. So those are very, very two different things. The human growth and development that probably everybody in this room went through is, is very science-based, very reproductive system. This is a lot more. And I think tying it to Danielle's point, there should have been more of a dialogue. I wish we could have had something like this. Because there's a lot of parents that are right now unsettled with the material. I've been very outspoken about the material. Um, I think if we could have had something like this, I think we could not have a lot of comments off the public now that if you don't agree with this, if this doesn't agree with your family value or that you're anti LGBTQ. And that is just simply false and unfair. And, and so there's a lot of hurt feelings right now in the community on this. I think it could have been handled a lot better. So I want to say on yeah, okay right. on what this meeting is. So your question was: Is it embedded in this strategic plan that being our human growth and development curriculum is? It, is it inclusive? What is is the curriculum inclusive? What curriculum? Human growth and development. So it is not part of the strategic plan okay. conversation. So, so if you if you want to have a strategic if you want to have a human growth and development. Conversation that probably maybe we should end our strategic planning listening session and then I can stick around and listen to other comments that you have. But our our goal this evening was to discuss the strategic plan. And I hope I and there were a lot of questions. We've been here for two hours. I think I, I hopefully have answered. I hope you walk away not having any questions uh, on the strategic plan. And, but if you do still have a question, I will stick around and obviously discuss other topics as well. Jamie, I want to make sure before we end, if there are any questions virtually. There are no um, hands raised virtually. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you. And I'll stick around. You know, there was an article on the front of 